What up, Cavs Nation? I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and I'm back with another episode of the Want and Gold Talk podcast. We ended last podcast with a lot of fun. We and Chris got into some drink conversations, some trip conversations, all these different things. And then we came back to Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse tonight and had to relive those because we were stuck in Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse for a little bit after the game. The garage wouldn't open, all these different things. But we got out of there, and so did the Cleveland Cavaliers with a 118-87 win over the Washington Wizards. Chris, this is the first time that the Cavs have held uh, a team under 90 points since November 1st against the New York Knicks at Madison Square Garden. So a good game defensively for a team that's been struggling on that end of the floor. What did you take away from tonight's game and tonight's matchup? I think the thing that stands out to me is just, you know, you don't want to say that this is necessarily a trap game, Ethan, because the odds of the Wizards finding a way to beat the Cavs, very, very slim, even in the unpredictable NBA where lots of things can happen. And the Cavs last year lost to the Portland Trail Blazers, but um, it just didn't feel like this was ever one of those games that the Cavs were going to lose. But I felt like it was a game where the Cavs could have had a performance that left you scratching your head, or you could have looked back on it and said they didn't play all that well. Um, I thought there was some sloppiness offensively. I thought they had a hard time finding their rhythm offensively, but they were locked in. They were focused. Um, and sometimes there's a tendency to let up. Sometimes there's a tendency to overlook an opponent, especially because think about this game being sandwiched between a Boston game and a Denver game. And then the Boston win was an emotional win. It was a come from behind win. It was something that took a lot out of the guys, both physically and mentally. They didn't have Ty Jerome coming into the night because he's dealing with an illness that's actually going around the locker room that is leading to guys getting x-rays from the medical staff to see what they're dealing with and seeing if they're okay, even if they might be feeling okay. Is there something there in their lungs? Is there something there in their chest? So it's something to monitor over the next couple of days. But Without Ty Jerome coming off the emotional win against Boston with Denver on the horizon on Thursday, um, this was a game where, you know, the Cavs could have could have had one of those stinkers early and just turned it on late. But but that wasn't the case. They built a double digit lead like four minutes into the game, and they cruised to this win over Washington. So I think it speaks to their maturity. I think it speaks to their professionalism. I think it speaks to their buy in. I think it speaks to a team that is listening and taking the message from Kenny Atkinson, the one that he delivered yesterday, the one that he delivered again today before shoot around about attention to detail, about focus, about playing to their standard and stuff like that. And, and to me, you know, you don't want to overblow anything that happens in a game against the Washington Wizards, but they played to their standard, especially on the defensive end of the floor. And it was nice to see from the Cavs perspective, them getting back to that level of defense that that we have seen um, at various points throughout the course of the year, but certainly not consistently. And Chris, you mentioned what Kenny Atkinson said before shoot around, and he mentioned it after the game. Like they came into tonight, they came into today acting as if they were a 500 team. They weren't looking at, the Wizards and say, oh, they have the worst record in the NBA. We can just gloss over them. They said, we're going to, and as we've mentioned in, in earlier on into the season, they wanted to put that lead on them early to give their other players an opportunity to get off the floor and also to give players, role players, a chance mm-hmm. to get on the floor. But that came at a caveat today, especially, Chris, when you talk about Ty Jerome being out, the Cleveland Charge having a game, and then also the fact that Jalen Tyson and Craig Porter Jr. played in said uh, Cleveland Charge game at noon this afternoon before coming back and being activated a part, as a part of the Cleveland Cavaliers. It was interesting when you talk about all those different things and Kenny Atkinson mentioning after the game that he didn't want 
that Jalen Tyson and, and Craig Porter Jr. to come into tonight, not get to play against the team if something might have happened or whatever. So he um, talked to the organization and said, I want them to go down there and get some acclimation and get some minutes uh, and some run because they hadn't gotten as much in um, in the NBA. What have you seen from them? What do you think kind of <laughs> – they played, I think, around six minutes in the NBA and around a lot more. And, yeah. Yeah, around 30 in the Cleveland Charge game. For players to play in two games in the NBA, have you seen that before in a day? Yes, I've seen that a bunch of times. Uh, the Cavs did that with Dean Wade early on in his tenure when he was bouncing between – the charge and he was bouncing between um, the Cavs. And at that point they were playing in Canton. So he was making um, a little bit of an hour drive just to get to the arena after those games. And uh, Joe Harris was the first person that took the quote unquote Canton shuttle from uh, where they played their home games to rocket mortgage field house. Joe Harris, when he was, you know, playing with the Cavs during the LeBron like eras, Um, And it was always so funny with Joe because he would walk into the arena um, like as soon as the locker room would open up for reporters 75 minutes before tip off. Like that's when he was getting the game. And the first thing that he wanted to do was just sit in his chair and eat peanut butter and jelly. So always was joking with him about just the grind of doing that in the afternoon and then the recovery process, and he said his recovery process was basically the one-hour drive back to the arena. Um, so, yeah, I've seen it before. It's certainly rare. Um, but I talked to Craig Porter Jr. about it, and I talked to Jalen Tyson about it, and I asked them if it was something that they wanted to do. And the sense that I got in, in talking to them is that it was kind of like a 50-50 approach. Um, it was partially the Cavs organization. President of Basketball Operations, Kobe Altman, General Manager Mike Ganzi, Assistant GM Brandon Weems, and Kenny Atkinson together saying, hey, you know, these guys haven't gotten a lot of minutes here with the NBA team. Um, let's get them some, let's get them some extended playing time. Let's let's get them to build some confidence. Let's get them some meaningful reps and some game action. Uh, the G League is not the NBA. It's not, but it's physical, it's competitive. Um, The team that they played earlier today was riding a winning streak coming into the G League game. Uh, There were some former NBA players on that team, some former first-round picks on that team that they played against. Um, So the other part of it was Jalen Tyson and Craig Porter Jr. recognizing that, hey, our role is going to be sporadic here on this NBA team. Obviously, it's a 10, 11-man rotation most nights for Kenny Atkinson. And we're not a consistent part of that. And it's just the reality of the situation that they're in. It's a numbers game. Uh, You cannot play 13 or 14 unless you're Steve Kerr. And he's run into issues trying to do that too, by the way. Um, It's just really, really difficult. So for these guys, it's an opportunity to stay sharp. It's an opportunity to work on different aspects of their game uh, that they needed to work on. You know, Jalen Tyson was telling me that He didn't like the way that he was playing offensively when he got opportunities with the Cavs. As sporadic as they were, um, he didn't like the way that he was playing offensively. So he went down um, to the charge and he tried to work on those things and he tried to fix some of those things in a meaningful game environment as opposed to, you know, one-on-oh workouts at the practice facility or two-on-two workouts or three-on-three workouts at the practice facility and stuff like that. So. It's, it's all part of these young players um, just trying to find a way to stay sharp, stay in rhythm, and show an organization that they're willing to do whatever it takes um, to be ready um, and, and get the kind of reps that they believe are going to be beneficial for their own internal development. And like you mentioned, he wanted to work on his offensive game, and it was Jalen Tyson's Cleveland Charge debut today mm-hmm. and he went off and had 25.6 rebounds five assists and two steals while knocking down a go-ahead three-pointer with five minutes left um and then cpj craig porter jr you know he had a couple of games down there last year kind of showcasing that he didn't belong in the g league last year right. that kind of helped him earn that standard contract he finished with 13 6 4 and 2 so those are pretty good numbers for a guy that has kind of worked his way back and forth between the rotation 
And then you talk about tonight's game with the Washington Wizards. And it was interesting, Chris, because we knew Ty Jerome wasn't going to be playing tonight. Dean Wade was back. So there was another element for that. Jalen Tyson's minutes were going to be depleted even more as a four-man or a three-man, depending on where Dean Wade was going to be placed. But then you talk about the injuries that happened throughout the Wizards game. It was a lot. I think there were at least four players from uh, but combined from both teams that went to the locker room throughout the game. The two major ones for the Cavs were obviously Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland. Donovan Mitchell ran into Jonas Valanciunas on a screen saying that after the game, he was like, sometimes I like to take that challenge. And other times I need to recognize that I don't need to do that. <laughs> and that was one of them. He kind of ran into him and it looked bad at first because he kind of just had his arm, his right arm, his shooting arm dangling as he yeah. walked towards the locker room. He didn't stop at the bench at all, went directly to the locker room. And then just a few minutes later, after he came back to the bench and back into the game, Darius Garland was on the floor and had to go back to the locker room and did not return after getting hit in the head, allegedly by Jonas Valanciunas. So mm-hmm. big guy for the Washington Wizards, uh, uh, <laughs> inflicting some damage for key players to the Cleveland Cavaliers star guards. Probably un- unfortunate for him because that just points him in a bad light, but Right. It's a basketball game. Everybody is trying to play the game hard, all those different things. Nothing seemed intentional. But, Chris, both of those guys seemed fine. Darius Garland said that he had a little bit of a headache um, yeah. after the game, but that was about it. Kenny Atkinson said that Darius is not going to miss any time, and Donovan Mitchell obviously came back. So I know Kenny has said some things in jest before. <laughs> I want to get your thoughts on, on what your sources might have been saying about both of these situations. Yeah, the feeling leaving the arena tonight is that the Cavs certainly dodged them. Um, Donovan coming back in the game and playing the way that he did when he returned from that injury to his right shoulder, as Donovan termed it, as Kenny Atkinson termed it, a stinger, kind of like a football-related injury. Um, To see him, you know, be effective enough and hit that three, get that steal, um, basically put the game out of reach and he basically waved goodbye to the Wizards after he made that last three. Um, that was promising, I think, from the Cavs standpoint. He didn't have any ice on his shoulder when he was by his locker. He didn't get any extra treatment with his um, personal trainer, Murphy Grant. Um, so a lot of positive signs from that standpoint. And when it comes to Darius, he walked out of of the locker room with some kind of painkillers in his hand, obviously. And he did talk about having a headache. But, um, you know, concussion things are are very, very interesting. Concussion-related things are very, very interesting. And um, you can't make immediate determinations on them because it could happen tonight. It could happen tomorrow. He could start feeling the after effects and some symptoms and stuff like that. But... I'll say this, positive signs that in a loud, chaotic environment, Darius was there. In a bright environment, with light shining on him, the Cavs locker room, Darius was there. Um, In a post-game environment, with a bunch of media members around him, he was willing to talk, and the Cavs had him talk following the game. And I'm not saying that this all points to He doesn't have a concussion. He could pop up in the injury report and he could feel symptoms after the fact. But after being evaluated for a head injury in the locker room during the second half, not being able to come back, um, to see him be in that environment, all the things that if you did see signs of a concussion in the examination, you would have him avoid doing those things. You wouldn't have put him in the bright locker room. You wouldn't have had him in the loud locker room. Um, You wouldn't have had him talking to reporters after the game, like nothing was wrong. So I would say positive signs from that standpoint too. And, you know, when it comes to Darius, Ethan, every every time he gets hit above the neck, let's just say above the neck, jaw, eye, head, face, other eye, mouth, you name it. You always have some sense of worry within an organization and, and the Cavs, you could tell that they were like, oh, geez, we got to go check on him. Let's make sure, you know, one of the doctors that did go check on him is somebody who is known for kind of like 
the head injury type stuff that happens with the team. So seeing him follow Darius was a little bit of a nervy moment, I would say, for the organization, especially given all the things that he's dealt with in the past. Um, but it seems like there are promising signs when it comes to both of those guys. And it does seem like the Cavs dodged him. Yeah, Chris. And, and I like the, I don't like it, but the word that Kenny Atkinson used, stinger, that's initially the way that um, Donovan ran into Jonas Valanciunas, that mm-hmm. kind of looked like what it had happened. It didn't look like it dislocated. It just felt like when you sit down too long and your leg turns into TV static and you can't move it. <laughs> like you you literally, because <laughs> it looked like he was just holding it there and it didn't look like he like was trying to pop it back in or anything. It was like, okay, yeah. can I get feeling back in my arm? Right. Um, so, and, and those are different things. And I still need to ask Kenny Atkinson about this because he uses so many different football terms, but that's a podcast for a different day. He uses football terms. He uses hockey terms. He uses a bunch of stuff. He might start using soccer terms next week. Who knows? Just kind of change it up. Who knows? Striker. <laughs> And especially, I, I know people that watched the, the interview with Darius after the game were like, Donovan was kind of getting on him and joking with him and talking yep. about how he was talking too soft. Like, Donovan, yep. Darius always talks soft. So I, I did, I'm very confused. It was softer Donovan... than usual, though. Fair. It was. I had to lean my head in a little bit more, even when I was trying to talk to him privately afterward. Um, he was very cognizant of trying not to be too loud because... <laughs> I think his head was still pounding at that point in time. Probably. probably. It was also a good sign that he was joking and he was laughing and he was smiling and he was cracking jokes with Donovan. And he was, uh, as I was interviewing Jalen Tyson for the piece that I'm working on, um, he was messing with Jalen Tyson during that interview too. So a lot of positive signs just on the injury front when it comes to the Cavs. Just watch the illness thing. That's what I'm going to say over the next couple of days. Watch the illness thing. It's not just Ty Jerome. It is going around the locker room, and the Cavs are a little bit worried about it, just in terms of like keeping the guys healthy and what kinds of remedies they're giving them um, to stay healthy. There are extra recovery shakes that were handed out today in the locker room for all of the different guys with like antioxidants and stuff like that in them. Right, and talking about the conversations between Darius and Donovan that – kept going throughout the entire time that we were in the locker room, it felt like. I mean, Darius said that he was going to stay in the locker room after talking to media just to mess with Donovan throughout his interview. So another positive sign, Chris. And then Donovan admitted (laughs) in front of everybody that he has been dealing with headaches for at least two weeks now because not something that he dealt with on the basketball court or anything like that. But for those who don't know, Donovan Mitchell wears prescription glasses, right? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't wear contacts during games. So, and he mentioned this in a different podcast when he, when he was talking to a group of guys about how he kind (laughs) of mentioned the LeBron James thing when LeBron got hit in the eye and said that he was looking at three rims. He mentioned that saying he just looks at the middle one (laughs) when he's playing basketball because of his depth perception. And that's why he doesn't wear contacts and all those different things. But he's been dealing with a headache for at least two weeks because he's had the wrong glasses prescription. (laughs) And I know fans might look back at Donovan's recent performances. I mean, tonight he was 40% from the field, 57.1% against Boston, 21.7 against Atlanta, 41.7 against Atlanta in that first game, in that first matchup, and be like, "Uh, it doesn't necessarily show that he's had difficulty or whatever, but like, (laughs) <laughs> that's Donovan Mitchell <laughs> for you. He's going to play yeah. through it and all those different things. But just to be in the locker room and hear him candidly talk with Darius about, like, try and make him feel better about having yeah. a headache. Like, hey, you're not the only one. That That's <laughs> always the, like, brotherly love that we like to see between the our two, uh, <laughs> two guards or our backcourt. Yeah, I mean, I think um... – a lot has been made of their relationship both on the court and off the court. And, you know, if you spend any time around this team whatsoever, you can see that they're very close. You can see that they speak the same language, that they understand one another, that they like being around each other, that they like playing with each other. 
And sure, there's some level of overlapping skill sets that can lead to on-court conflict at various points where it just doesn't look as natural as maybe it's looked with other guys, other tandems, other elite tandems in, in the past. But um, Donovan has been thrilled about teaming up with Darius since the minute he learned that he was being traded to Cleveland as opposed to New York. The, the prospect of playing with Darius was the one that sent Donovan gleefully running around the golf course. And since then, all they've done is continued to strengthen their bond and, and grow together. Um, I, I don't know if they're ever going to be as tight as like Darius and Tristan Thompson. Darius looks at Tristan as a big brother, but Darius and Donovan are very, very close. Darius likes playing with Donovan. Donovan likes playing with Darius. It has been working really, really well for the team this year, and they get along great um, behind the scenes as well. They talk with each other. They joke with each other. And if you spend any amount of time around this team, you can see the connection that they have goes far beyond just the basketball court. All right, Chris, last thing before we get out of here. Dean Wade came back. I feel like this is like an injury podcast, but Dean Wade came back from his ankle injury uh, and he played interestingly, <laughs> if that's a way to put it, right? Like he was over five from the field, all of those coming from beyond the arc. He had six rebounds um, and he had a steal. Kenny mm-hmm. Atkinson talked about how his defense and also Evan Mobley talked about this post game about how his defense makes life easier on Jarrett and Evan, um, and it makes it easier for them to trust that they don't have to go and help, which allows them to not do as much of the overhelping that we talked so much about this year, um, which is a big part of what Dean Wade does at, at the point of attack on defense. And Evan also talked about how Darius and Donovan taking those challenges now rather than uh, switching and then asking for help or, or just knowing that they need to go help is a big thing. But Chris, when it comes to Dean's play, how do you evaluate just game one back? I know you, it's a very small sample size and it's not a lot to look at, but were there anything, any concerns? Because the only thing for me is it still didn't look like he had his all of his lift back in his jump shot. Other than that, he looked fine to me. He was walking a little funky after the game. Um, so that's something that I think we have to continue to keep an eye on. How is his ankle going to respond after he played about 19 minutes tonight. And he just wasn't walking the same kind of way. He wasn't moving the same kind of way on the floor. I think that's to be expected. Um, This is part of the reason why I talked to the other night about how I think it would be better and beneficial for him to play in this game against Washington rather than taking an extra two days of recovery because he was clearly rusty. He was clearly out of rhythm. He didn't have his touch whatsoever. His first shot was an air ball. The other shots were sailing right and left as opposed to missing short and long. So it just was not a good night offensively for Dean Wade. Um, Defensively, he's going to make an impact. And that's the benefit of somebody like Dean. What you get from him on the offensive end is essentially a luxury. You just want him to space the floor. You want him to do the right things. You want him to be in the right spots. You want him to run to the corners. You want him to be willing to take the threes so that the defense has to be um, cognizant of him being an effective enough shooter or enough of a threat of a shooter. Um, But what they get from him defensively, there just isn't anybody on the team that can replicate that or anybody that plays the same positions as him that can replicate that. And I know it's sometimes hard for people to believe because when you think, you know, some of the best defenders in the NBA, you think Wemby, you think Bam, you think um, a bunch of other guys, Evan Mobley, Jared Allen, Draymond Green, Dyson Daniels, you think a bunch of other guys before you think Dean Wade. But for the last two years, the Cavs have been a significantly better defensive team with him on the floor. And he has become a premier defensive player that if you look at any advanced metric, Um, all the ones that are intended to identify impact and value and effect on a possession to possession basis. Dean is always one of the statistical leaders. And and I don't think that that is deceiving. 
I think there's a lot of truth in those numbers. You know, sometimes numbers can be really, really noisy, but I think there's a lot of truth in those numbers, especially when it comes to Dean. And it can be hard um, to really um, explain for the average basketball fan why that is, but, but I thought Kenny tried to explain it as well as he possibly could. And I think he explained it in a smart way that, that people can actually understand, right? It just, it puts everybody in the position that they should be in. And it keeps this defense from having to scramble around because he's able to keep guys in front of him in a way that is at a high level and a higher level than some of the other guys on this team, especially on a consistent basis. So you don't have that over helping. You don't have rotations that are kind of out of whack. You don't have those same communication breakdowns. So that's the beauty, I think, of Dean. On a night that he goes 0 for 5 and he looks completely lost and out of rhythm on the offensive end of the floor, he can impact the game in a number of different ways. He can do it rebounding, right? He can do it in terms of... um isolation defense. He can do it in terms of help defense. He can do, do it in terms of contesting shots on the perimeter, um, all those different things. And, and that's, you know, when you're talking about role players, that's what they have to do on a nightly basis. Just find a way somehow, some way to make an impact. And it could take a bunch of different forms, but for Dean, it seems like it consistently takes the form of bring us our best defense. And look, it's the Wizards. Again, it's the Wizards. They haven't won a game since October. They've won two all season long. They've got a bunch of lottery draft pick busts on their roster. And they are horrendous. They are. But as mayor of Dean Wade Island, it's not entirely a coincidence that their best defensive performance in the last couple of weeks came when he came back into the lineup. Just saying. <laughs> Dean Wade Island, folks. That That's the, the term of the week. Dean Wade Island. And obviously, we want to talk a little bit more about all these different things. But we're going to hold off for tomorrow's podcast. And that is going to be the next rendition of Hey, Chris. And we talk about the teams that the Cavs now have coming up. The Denver Nuggets, who just beat the Golden State Warriors tonight, 119-115. It's a good game, and you want to see how the Cavs are going to fare uh, in the sandwich matchup when you talk about Boston, Washington, Denver, about how uh, they're going to fare against one of the best teams in the Western Conference and one of the teams that everybody has their eyes on, especially when you talk about Nikola Jokic and what he does and impacts on the offensive and defensive end. And the last thing I'm going to say, when it comes to Dean Wade, is vertical spacing and how he can limit that of offensive players when it comes to getting up close to them and strength and all those different things. But Isaac Okoro and Dean Wade, difference is a lot, a lot of different guys are going to look at Isaac a little differently when they rise up against a six foot five person rather than a six foot nine mm -hmm. and a half player. So, yeah. Different things to look into and to keep an eye on, especially going into the game against Denver. I mean, yes, again, it was the Wizards. So we always have to lay that caveat out there. But they just weren't defending like this over the last two weeks. And if you want to know in part why, it's because they were missing one of their best defenders. Right? Like, that's not a fluke. It's not a coincidence. Dean not Wade helps them. Dean Wade makes them better. Dean Wade makes them a different kind of defense. They are capable of doing different things on the defensive end of the floor with him out there playing 18 to 25 minutes. They weren't defending like this, not even against bad teams that were on the schedule during this recent stretch when they didn't have Dean Wade. If you wonder why all the analytics people love him, <laughs> again, it was the Wizards, but it kind of showed up tonight in this type of situation. Kenny Atkinson loves to rave about it. Top five in isolation defense last year. <laughs> Top of the league in defensive rating. All these yes. different things. And obviously, just to wrap this up, 
the Cavs against opponents this year have held teams to 100 or less just twice against the New Orleans Pelicans and the Brooklyn Nets. Two teams that are not that great offensively at, at the moment. So things to keep an eye on as well as we continue to move forward. But yep. <laughs> if you want to talk a little bit more about being a part of Dean Wade Island or what <laughs> you like to think about when we talk about all of the different things when it comes to being stuck at the arena, you can leave your survey answers and feedback about the podcast where you can give your ideas and thoughts on what should be changed, what should be added. To do so, go to tinyurl.com slash WGPod. That's tinyurl.com slash WGPod. But with that being said, that'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs Insider and interact with Chris, me, and Jimmy by subscribing to Subtext. This is where you can leave your questions for tomorrow's episode of Hey Chris. We do it once a week, and this next one is going to be a good one. So sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word stop. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who signed up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from me, Chris, and Jimmy. This isn't just our podcast. It's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.